Yeah. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. So I'm Erad Friedman, I work at Fabric, formerly Comsys Robotics. It is a startup located in Israel. Uh, today I'll talk about our simulation and the benefit of the simulation. Uh, especially the time in the simulation can run faster than the real time. Uh, so we can simulate hours of robots work in seconds or minutes. So this is the agenda. I'll start with a short introduction and talk about simulation in general. Uh, then I'll talk about the architecture of our simulation and the benefits of it. Uh, I'll talk about the Python library we use to implement the simulation. And uh, then I'll talk about some challenges we encountered and the uh, way we deal with them. And finally, I'll talk about distributed or multi-process simulation due to the transition to microservices. So I'll start with the short background. Uh, so in Fabric, we build a micro-fulfillment warehouses where online orders are picked and delivered to customers. Most of the work is done by robots. Uh, here in the video, you can see two types of robots. The first type is called ground robots. These are the robots that move on the floor. The second type is called uh, lift robots. These are the robots that move on the shelving units. The lift robots take totes from the shelving unit, put them on the ground robots. The ground robots bring the tote into the picking stations where items are picked and later delivered. Uh, usually the term simulation means a tool that imitates the operation of another system. In our case, it's not fully correct. Um, we only simulate the hardware, the robots. So we run the rest of the system just as it runs in production. But instead of communicating with real robots, it communicates with the uh, virtual or simulated robots. So, so far I talked about uh, what we do and what we simulate. Now, this simulation tool has uh, several usages and benefits. The first one is that um, it is used as a as a testing tool for developers. So when developers write new code, uh, as long as the code doesn't run on the robot itself, this is the way to test the code. It also uh, runs as a regu regression test as part of our continuous integration center. Um, we use the simulation to compare between different algorithms and optimizations. Uh, in a complex system, it's difficult to know how a new code will affect the entire system and the KPIs. So this is the place to test it and to get the feedback before uh, moving it to production. Hardware and robots is, uh, is expensive and not scalable. Um, and the sim this simulation tool decouples the software and the hardware, so we can run as many simulations as we need on the cloud. We use the tool to evaluate uh, new warehouses before investing money in construction work. We can run the simulation and get uh, a feedback of uh, whether we can reach a desired KPI or, for example, how many robots are needed to reach a KPI. In simulation, it's uh, very easy to inject failures in the robots and by that to improve the robustness of the entire system. Uh, we have an integration center in our offices, but it's not as big as our product production uh, warehouses. Uh, here you can see a 3D map of uh, our first warehouse, which has more than 60 ground robots and 12 lift robots. So this is the only place you can uh, run the system on big setups before we run it in production. So these were the usages and benefits we get from the simulation tool. And now, now we'll talk about how we run the simulation. So the approach we are taking is called discrete event simulation. In this approach, continuous operations are uh, modeled by instant events. For example, if we want to simulate an elevator, then uh, the events can be like uh, elevator arrived, button pressed, door is open, and so on. So the simulation runs an event, calculate, uh, calculates the new state of the, of the component we are simulating. And then it moves to the next event. It also maintains its own, its uh, own clock and doesn't use the real world clock. And that's how it can run faster than the real time. In our, in the, in our simulation, in the case of the robots, we simulate the robot operations, which are moving on the warehouse, uh, turning, passing toward between lift robot to ground robot and so on. We do, we do it by treating the time as the event. So we divide the time into time ticks, and in each time tick, we calculate the new state of the robots. Let's uh, see an example. So if we take 
uh, the move operation. Let's say that a robot can move in a two meters per second, and we choose to have 10 time ticks per second. So at the beginning, the robot is located at point zero. Then the simulation will move to the next event, which <coughs> is in time 0.1, and calculate the new location of the robot, which is 20 centimeters. Because two meters per second and 10 time ticks in a second means uh, 20 centimeters in each time tick. Then again, it will move to the next uh, event, which is in time 0.2, Calculate the new location, which is 40 centimeters. Uh, notice that there is no intermediate uh, location for the robot. It's never located between 20 to 40. It moves directly from 20 to 40 centimeters. Uh, in the reality, the robot anyway sends a few telemetries in a second. So from the system point of view, it looks the same. It's discrete anyway. Uh, to implement this approach, we use the, the SymPy library. It is the open source written in Python. Uh, it has a lot of code samples and they're well documented and also very easy to use. We'll see it very soon. So to, to understand SIPA, you need to be familiar with the uh, three objects, environment, process, and events. Now the environment is the main object that uh, maintains the world simulation, maintain the simulation clock, and there's an event queue. The process represents the component we are simulating. So in this example, we have two processes. Uh, one for robot zero and one is robot one. Uh, at the beginning, the processes adds the initial event in the event queue. So we have the first event for robot zero and the second event for robot one. So wh when we start the simulation, the environment takes the first event in the queue. Uh, it, it runs it. So it calculates the new state of the robot. Before it ends, it adds the next event of that process in the queue. So now we have uh, another event of robot zero of time 0 0.1. And then it will take again the next event in the queue, which belongs to robot one at time zero, run it, calculate the new state, add the next event, and take the next event. Now, the next event belongs to time 0 0.1, so it updates the the simulation clock to point zero to point zero 0.01. So this is the basic idea of SimPy. Now we'll see an example after this slide. Um, so we'll see in the example that the uh, SimPy process is implemented by Python generator. And an important uh, thing to be aware of is the world simulation runs in the in a single thread. And I will mention I will mention it again later. Um, the approach I discussed so far is called uh, as fast as possible. It means that the simulation tries to run the fastest it can. It immediately moves from one event to the next event. Uh, but we can run SIMPA in a real-time mode, which tries to follow the real-time. It means that it will run an event, and before moving to the next event, it will wait until the time of the next event is arrived. Uh, the reason we may want to do this is uh, if we are doing some manual test in our simulation, or if we combine a real hardware in our simulation. Also, the environment can receive uh, the initial time as a parameter, which is the starting time of the simulation. Okay, now let's see some uh, Python. So in the example I'm going to show you, we are going to conduct a race of robots. So for the example, let's say that in every second, each robot can move somewhere between two to four uh, meters. Okay, this is not the example. So let's go over the code and understand it, and then we also run it. So we define uh, three robots in our race. Uh, the, the race is going to, to take for 30 seconds. And, and I choose to have two time ticks in uh, each second. So we'll have a time tick after every half a second. Here we implemented, we implement the simulated robot. So we support only the move operation of the robot. And as you can see, it is a Python generator. Each iteration of the while loop is a, an event. It is a time tick. So in each iteration, it calculates the new location of the robot. I use the random function to go and generate the new location. I provide it one and until two meters because we said a robot can move two to four meters and we have two time ticks in seconds. So it is one to two meters in every time tick. Then, every, then the robot prints the simulation time, the robot ID and the new location. So at the beginning, we initialize the environment object. We register the Python, the SimPy processes to the, to that environment, the robots in our case. And then we start the simulation for 30 seconds. So let's run and see. Don't worry, it won't take 30 seconds. So, okay. 
So I'm going to run it with the time command, which shows us the, the time it takes the program to run. So let's see the output. Okay, so as you see, we ran a uh, 30 seconds of race in less than one second, and that's what I meant by that we can uh, run faster than the real time. Um, now, as you, if you remember, I, I said that uh, together with the simulated robot, we run the entire system just as it runs in production. So the simulated robot is the only place where the code is aware of SimPy and whether it is a production or simulation. In this example, we couldn't see it because we only ran uh, robots, but we'll see it better in the next example. Also, the parameters that affect the duration of the simulation are obviously the number of simulated components. The more components, then there is more calculations to do in each time tick and the slower simulation. And uh, the same for a uh, time tick granularity. The bigger granularity, then more time ticks in a second and more and the slower uh, simulation. Uh, so the benefits we get from this approach, uh, the, the most obvious one is that it makes the development process uh, more efficient. Developers, when they finish, uh, when they write a new code, uh, they test it using this tool, and they wait less time, and also the, the CI is shorter. Uh, but as you can imagine from the previous slide, uh, it is not always the case. If we run the simulation on uh, big setups, then it could be that the simulation will be even slower than the real time, but it's still a benefit because uh, that way the simulation will still be more realistic and the time will not run too fast. Um, because every in each time tick, every robot gets the CPU time, the, a chance to calculate the new location that it would do in the real world. Uh, from the same reason, it also doesn't matter if we run it on our uh, private laptop or on a strong machine in the cloud. The duration of the simulation may be affected, but the result will be deterministic and realistic. Also, it is agnostic to profiling and debugging, so this is a powerful advantage. We also calculate the ratio between the time we are simulate the real time we are simulating to the time it takes the simulation. Um, and if this ratio changes, then it may mean, doesn't necessarily, but it may mean that we added some inefficient stuff in the code, like a slower, a slow database query or anything like that. Um, also, since the simulation uses its own clock, then it is very easy to set the starting time of the simulation, simulation, and uh, by that to simulate the system like it is running on the weekend or any special date or time. Okay, but uh, the simulation is more complex than, one, than, why I than what I described so far. Um, as I said, we run our entire system together with the simulated robots. Um, and the entire system is more event-driven oriented. So it has some threads, components that listen to a queue, gets uh, an event, either a telemetry from a robot or uh, an input from the users and act accordingly. The problem is that if we run the simulated robots together with the, the event-driven thread, it may be that the simulated robot will run the, t the time too fast, and the event-driven thread will not have enough time to do what they need to do. And the result of the simulation will not be very realistic. So SimPy has a support for event-driven processes, but as I said, uh, SimPy run in a single uh, thread. And we want our simulation to run just like it runs in, in the real world in production. Um, so, we, and we also had a, a bad experience with a similar uh, solution. We used the Gvent Monkey patch, which makes the thread cooperative and runs the system as a single thread. It uh, improved the performance a lot, but then we found out that we have some bugs that we couldn't see in the single threaded simulation. So we, so this uh, solution is not so good for us and we, choose to, to solve it in other way. So in simulation, we run another SimPy process, which in every time tick, it, it holds the simulation time and lets the event-driven thread do its work. We do it by calling the join function on the queue of the event-driven thread. The join function uh, blocks until the queue gets empty. And that's how we stop the time to run too fast. Uh, let's see an example. So here I'm going to show you an example that we are, we are going to have uh, two objects. One is the simulated robots, which in every time tick sends a message to the event-driven thread, and the event-driven thread will print it to the screen. Let's uh, go over the code. 
So for simplicity, we'll have a time tick, one time tick in every one second. Uh, at first, I'll show you the problem. So ignore the event of an queue. We'll, we'll see it later. So here we, I implement the event driven thread. Uh, it is very simple. What it does is listening to the queue, getting a message, print it to the screen, marking the task as done and keep doing it all the time. Here you can clearly see that uh, this thread is not aware of SimPy. It doesn't wear whether it is a simulation or production. It's the same for both. Now here we implement a simulated robot, which is pretty similar to the previous example. What it does in every time tick inside the while loop, it uh, puts a message in the event driven thread queue, increments the counter, and tests the environment that will run again after one time tick. So here again, we initialize the environment to see the problem. So I use the native Python queue and start the event driven thread, register the simple process like before and run the simulation. So we are going to run a 50 second simulation and we said we are expecting to see one line per second. So we should see about 50 lines. So let's run it. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So surprisingly, we don't see any output. And this is exactly the problem I talked about. The robot ran the time too fast and the event driven thread didn't have a time to, to do its work. So the result is not so realistic. Let's now fix the problem. So for, to fix it, as you can see, we inherit from the Python queue. And if it is a simulation, then we register another SimPy process that performs this function, the simjoin. And in every time tick, what it does is calling the join on the queue, which as we said, waits until the queue gets empty. And then there's the environment that will run again in the next example. So oh, I need to work with this queue this time. Okay, let's save it. Now let's run the example with our own queue. And as we can see, we got a uh, 49 logs, 49 lines, like almost like we expected. The last one, we didn't have a time to do it. Two more points to complete the story. So, um, since we run the same code in production and in simulation, then we can use the default Python, the default time uh, functions of Python. So we wrapped all these functions in our own module and the entire system calls uh, this module. So th this module is also aware whether it is a production or simulation, but the entire module is not. The entire system is not. Also, uh, in simulation, we care more about the simulation time. So we print it to the log uh, for investigation and debugging. And uh, now eventually we also move to microservices like everyone else. But um, as I said, SimPy doesn't support uh, multi-threaded simulation. So for sure it doesn't support multi-process simulation. So the solution we came up with is this one. We In simulation, we run another service called the barrier server. The responsibility of the barrier server is this, to synchronize the time of the other services and to prevent one service to run uh, too fast from the other, faster than the other services. The rest of the services look more or less the same, just like a uh, multi-threaded simulation that I described so far. Each one of them has its own uh, SimPy, its local SimPy, and it works like this. Other services pick a shared time tick, and they add another uh, SimPy process that runs when that shared time, time tick uh, arrives. So at the be beginning, they start the uh, SimPy, they do whatever they need to do. When the time of the shared time tick arrives, each uh, service sends a ready message to the barrier server. The barrier server holds this message until it receives a ready message from all the other services. And then it sends approval to all the services. And then that's how we make sure to synchronize the time of the, of the services. And uh, notice that once the service sends a ready message until it gets an approval, the time for this service holds. It just waits until all the other services, uh, all, the, all the, the other services will reach this time tick too. So that's it. This is the summary of what I talked about. Uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Aaron, for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions?
Thanks for the talk. Uh, so using a discrete event simulation uh, framework, you seem to have con converted that in a sense by feeding it a stream of consistently timed uh, events, saying to run every one or 0.5 or so seconds, mm -hmm. where conventionally what discrete event means is that the agents in the system sort of dictate when events happen. Uh, if the uh, search here is for performance, uh, is that a knob that you explored um, uh, to get more? Um. I understand the first part, but can you repeat the question instead, the second part? So the the question is really, um, did you try to eliminate the sort of clock, just allow the system agents to uh, generate the events themselves in uh, what is often a very powerful tactic for speeding up these kinds of simulations? Mm. Um. Okay, this kind of uh, approach, we also thought about it, I think, but I think in this case it will be difficult to synchronize the operation of the entire system together with the events of the simulated robots. So I'm not sure the result will be very real, like in the reality, so if I understand you. Just... Um, I was just wondering about the uh, the way you split it into a distributed service. What dimension do you split it on? Is it in each individual robot, which is then because that would give you a reason to need to sync uh, sync sync everything up again, or yeah, just clarifying. Um, so we did the split because we moved to microservices and. Not because of the robots, the entire system now runs in uh, different services. So we wanted it to be in simulation too. But we also run the robots on different process now, which we also um, get the profit of running on more cores. Because in Python, you know, it can't run on uh, multiple cores. Yeah, sure. I'm just wondering, um, is it different simulations of the entire system that you are splitting into individual tasks? Or is it each part of the simulation which you then need to sync up again mm, if I understand the question then now we move to distributed simulation yes, it's not I a different simulation it's, uh, this was the question oh. it's more what is your um, why do you need to distribute it what are you distributing ok so it, the entire system is, was distributed the backend the, not the robots the part that manages the system it was anyway distributed to microservices, so we wanted to distribute the simulation itself to run also in distributed. Okay, thanks. Okay. A question related uh, to the models for the agents. Uh, so how flexible is a SymPy regarding uh, these models for these agents? Can I just put in some kind of a model factory for the agents? Or is it uh, this more like a rigid kind of API that supports certain kinds of models? Uh, SymPy is the infrastructure. It just gives you the API to use the, the distributed event simulation and you need to implement the entire logic and the operation of the, of the simulated component. Well, thanks for the talk. Um, what you do in, in, in distributed simulation is also commonly called uh, co-simulation. In, at least in, in, in science. Uh, did you check any other co-simulation frameworks if that would suit your needs? Uh, okay, thank you for the comment. Um, actually not, because we, were, we already were too deep into SymPy and the entire, and the whole infrastructure uses SymPy. So to move from the multi-threaded simulation, which I described first to the distributed simulation, was very, very simple. Maybe another approach will, uh, it would be better from scratch, but for us it was very simple to move to the distributed simulation. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank Aaron again for the talk. Thanks.